Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. My name is Jan Sveinar, and I am uh, the moderator uh, for today's session. We have a uh, terrific lineup uh, of speakers, and we'll have a chance for uh, questions and answers from uh, <coughs> the floor. We'll start with uh, Carl Hahn, who has had an impressive, truly impressive career in business as well as in policy advising, and is now focusing on the issue of uh, uh, Europe's uh, education and the shortcomings in it. He'll deliver the uh, principal uh, speech. Then we will have Marco Antonio Fernandez Martin <coughs> from Mexico focusing on a complementary set of issues uh, relating to European uh, education. And then Jan Machacek, uh, our own uh, person here from the Czech Republic, focusing, and I will let him focus on whatever he wants because he will react to the previous two speakers. I will step in as uh, I deem desirable since I'm myself very much interested in education in Europe as well, having uh, uh, been both uh, educated here partially, partially being active in creating educational institutions here. So, <coughs> Mr. Hahn, please, with uh, no further ado, please give us your address. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm most honored to be permitted to address you in this most beautiful uh, room, in this most beautiful town, in this very important country I'm very closely linked to, notwithstanding that I come from Germany. And strange enough, I'm active in education, which is quite different from what I have done all my life. In 1989, it seems there was nothing that could hinder the triumphal march of the Western democracies under the United States leadership. Today, however, there are new actors demanding their place and their voice among the new influential nations of the world. The best example in this context is China, which in spite of all current problems, will soon be taking over from the United States as the world's foremost economy. Responsible during the last 10 years, at least for one third of the growth of GNP of the world. Against this background, the question arises as to the productivity, creativity, performance, and competitiveness of our democratic system in Europe under the conditions of globalization. The world today is, a, is in a state of flux, unprecedented in the history of mankind, and the globalization and progress of science and technology are confronting us with challenges which in terms of their scale, complexity, and pace surpass everything mankind has ever found itself having to master to date. What are the key questions? Is the Western-style liberal democratic system capable of coping with the new challenges? The situation is exacerbated for us Europeans by the fact that all of these challenges, challenging tasks, have to be addressed and mastered against a backdrop of dramatic geoeconomically and politically driven changes in emphasis. Having lost, we Europeans, all our privileges, which were which secured Europe's superiority and dominance in the world over centuries. It is today, first and foremost, the Asians, with their hunger for success, who are searching with the utmost determination onto the world market and alongside the Americans, increasingly determining the pace of progress. Consequently, its growing economic weight also means that Asia, which is home to over 60% of the world's population, has in the meantime become a powerful political member of the world stage, which knows how to emphatically assert its interests. While the shift in the balance of power 
in the world is taking place, the old continent, burdened as it is by a shrinking, increasingly aging and more and more expensive population, and a dramatic debt overload is in danger of falling behind. This, from an economic and scientific standpoint, is also particularly the case in the field of the technologies of the future, from genetic engineering, biotechnology, nuclear technology, I shouldn't even mention, and microelectronics right through to modern knowledge-intensive services or artificial intelligence. New internet-based business ideas are hardly to be found in Europe, unfortunately. Whether Google, Yahoo, Amazon, Facebook, Facebook, Apple, Dell, Intel, or Microsoft, they all exclusively originated under the creative climate of the United States. And you will have in your pocket, I bet, no German handy. You will have in your office no Euro much European equipment and your computer, everything will come from the other side of the Atlantic. The fact is, however, that even in the more traditional sectors of the economy, which in particular make up our economic strength at the current time, like machine tools or consumer goods or automobiles, Europe is coming under growing competitive pressure as a result of the digital transformation. The advance of this technology will not only radically change the position of the human in the work process or daily life, as we all know, but also make profound changes in our economy and our society as well. Not only will the automobile be driving autonomously in the future, but also our factories. Many of our offices will be empty. The upshot will be tens of millions of jobs in production and administration and in science, in development, technical development, at issue a situation sure to prove a crucial test for democracy, especially in Europe. Whether our system based on the combination of democracy and a market economy will ultimately assert itself will predominantly depend on the extent to which it succeeds in getting people on board and convincing them. Unlike in the US or many of the Asian countries, for example, new technologies are met here in Europe with great scepticism and in some cases even hostility among a not insignificant proportion of the population. This is often due to the lacking political, technical and economic understanding. It will only be possible to overcome these widespread fears and reservations by ensuring adequate preparation of the people for the challenges of tomorrow to make democracy function. It will not be possible to achieve such a change in the people's mindset overnight. It will take time, which we basically do not have. And above all, the right strategy we lack also. Education plays a key role in this context, for which reason education policy, consequently, must be strategy factor number one. After all, a democracy can only function with responsible, informed citizens capable of understanding our increasingly complex world. Indeed, the level of education among the population at large ultimately determines the quality of the democratic process and the well-being of states and thus of our citizens. Against this background, the success of economic powers will therefore depend more than ever on the extent to which they succeed in mobilizing their citizens' intellectual potential 
and thus strengthening their powers of judgment and motivation. At the latest, since the first PISA study, in other words, as far back as 15 years ago, we know that the education system in most European countries, including Germany, is not the best by far. In spite of some progress achieved since then, we have hardly raised our standards about above the level of mediocrity in international comparison with the PISA leaders. Countries such as South Korea, Singapore, or China as well show us how to do better. Taiwan and Japan are also ahead in the PISA ratings in all aspects, and LEAD is growing. This is not least due to their particularly high levels of investment in education. Not one of the OECD countries spends as much on education as, for example, South Korea, which as recent as 60 years ago didn't even have an adequate number of primary schools, and today is leading number two in the world patent statistic. Korea at the time was comparable to the poorest countries of Africa. At the very top of the ratings, with an ever-increasing lead in all PISA disciplines, is the Shanghai region. China can afford whatever is important. That's food for thought. As an OECD study impressively verifies, however, even pupils from lower social strata in the poor and remote areas of China are achieving far better results at school than their age peers, even those from the wealthy upper class in the UK. China children seem to have a great thirst for knowledge and a high degree of motivation characteristics which are all too frequently lacking and not only among our school children, unfortunately. The fact of working class children achieving the educational level of pupils of elite schools in Britain ought to serve as an alarm signal. But not, nobody seemed to have woken up but the British Minister of Education he dashed to China, but nobody else. If Europe, with a proportion of not, of not even 6% of the world population by 2050, intends to remain a front rank global player and political actor among the world powers, then we must reorient our educational structures in their entirety to be changed global framework conditions and the pace of change itself. Alongside corresponding investments in education, this also calls above all for the courage to innovate pedagogical terms. This does not remain, mean that we have to go to great lengths to reinvent everything, however. What is in most cases needed, however, is merely a look outside the box coupled with the readiness to pragmatically learn from those achieving better results than we. Education policy means in particular preparation for the globalized environment in which we are already living, but not, not much improving our present system dating back to the 18 and 1900s. The foundation for enhanced educational results is already laid during three years of the kindergarten time of our children, which have until now been rather neglected by education policy, however. In the interest of protecting our youngest against supposedly educational overburdening, their intellectual development is put on a back burner during this kindergarten phase, and they are allowed to play and frequently bore themselves, while the brain at this time is growing at its fastest speed. The upshot is that intellectual potential 
remains untapped, even though children, especially in the early phase of their development and driven by their natural thirst for knowledge, display a speed of not learning exactly, but absorbing, that will never again be achieved in later life. This means that we are already setting the wrong course for our children in the first years of their lives, which irreversibly consequences for the rest of their lives. Thanks to the modern neurosciences, we know exactly that besides their genetic predisposition, the intellectual capabilities of every individual is to a very great extent also determined by external influences. The more stimulating the environment, the more marked the development, the inherited capabilities as well. Already in the womb and through the childhood phase, there are time windows opening within which the child's mental receptiveness in particular, strong and efficient, is targeted. This, is also, this also applies for learning, for learning languages as an example. Already at the tender age of two, our youngest literally soak up their native language as anyone can observe. In this phase, children are also effortlessly capable of simultaneously learning a second or a third language if they already start to do so at an early age, as I know from my own experience. At the age of 10, the development of the speech center, however, in our brain has been largely completed. However, in other words, at a point in time at which we are generally only just starting with foreign languages in our school, tediously, inefficiently, and moreover with limited success, as most of you will know from own experience. The earlier the time at which childhood education is commenced, therefore, the greater the development potential for that child's later life. In other words, his IQ level failing in this phase of children's development cannot be made up for a later stage. What we therefore need are investments in education, kicking in at the earliest possible time and already securing the highest standard of education and care in our kindergarten, including reading, math, writing, etc., which gives the children endless pleasure given that qualified teachers are provided accordingly. Such early childhood development in which children can gain the basics of all talents and capabilities also creates a basis for a general improving of school-based education later on, and thus also for an earlier and a better start into studies and professional life. A, strong, a string of long-term studies verifies that in kindergarten, decisive markers are already laid down for later life for the best possible intellectual success, and thus for the highest returns in both individual as well as social benefits. A kindergarten project, which we started eight years ago in Wolfsburg, with native speakers in line with the British curriculum, has fully confirmed these scientific findings in practical application. The children taking part, the first of whom are in the meantime at a high school, impress not only with their learning, with their absorbing capacity and pace, their social behavior and interaction, too, is far more advanced and better than that of their age peers, brought up and educated by means of the traditional method. Have you ever seen speechless but very overwhelmed happy parents when they listen to their children singing Chinese songs? This is something which I can only recommend, as children seem to love Chinese. It's for them as easy as their mother tongue. We also need a reorientation, however, 
in higher education policy. The majority of American universities are organized on an entrepreneurial basis, highly competitive and predominantly privately financed. They are thus capable of reaching timely to new developments in the world or, like so often, pioneering new developments. They are at the same time, in many cases, far less bureaucratic than their competitors abroad, except the British. And this creates the climate and in turn unleashes creativity and initiative. Moreover, the promotion of elites is also seen as a totally different light in the US or China as compared with, for example, large parts of Europe where the topic even continues to be stigmatized. The Americans also use their first-class universities as a magnet for international elites and do so very successfully. And I talk elites as in an elite university to be accepted is a matter of about five, six, seven percent. 70 percent of the Nobel, Nobel Prize winners are currently working at American universities. Before World War II, there was a total of six Nobel Prize recipients in the United States, which is also, it has been very lucrative as a side effect, generating import stimuli for the country's economy as illustrated by the concentration on future-oriented industries in the United States, which we are lacking to a very high degree in Europe. One quarter of the companies in Silicon Valley, an area which incidentally accounts for approximately one third of all venture capital investments in the US to date, were started by Chinese and Indian immigrants. And uh, this is uh, exactly what is the future. If the annual statistics published by the Financial Times or also by the prestigious Jiao Tong University in Shanghai with the ranking of the world's best universities are to be believed, the Anglo-Saxon universities appear to have a monopoly where world-class elite academic institutions are concerned. The current edition, edition of the Jia Tong University ranking, the most widely followed index of its kind worldwide, puts 51 US universities alone and nine British among the top 100 in the world. The best placed German university is the University of Heidelberg, ranked 46. No reason, therefore, to keep a low profile. The best university on the continent is the ETH in Zurich, the engineering college of the uh, Swiss uh, 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 country of Zurich. No reason, therefore, to keep a low profile. Food for thought for us in Germany in particular is nevertheless a fact that Switzerland, a country one-tenth of the size of Germany, is represented among the best 100 universities of the world with the same number of universities as Germany. It doesn't seem to upset anybody in Germany, but I consider this as a lot of food for thought, but nobody seems to eat. Uh, the number is four. Four universities in Switzerland, four universities in Germany. In many emerging countries, too, above all in China, university education is experiencing a veritable boom. The Chinese are intent on creating a super league of universities capable of comparison with the world's best. We also observe that American universities are crowded, the elite universities, by Chinese students. 
the average about 160,000 since Mr. Deng Xiaoping in 1978 as his first measure in order to end the days of Mao Zedong decided to send young people to United States elite universities. And today when you get and try to get a summer course at an elite American university, it is close to impossible. They are all sold out to Chinese executives. In the globalized world in which the struggle to attract the brightest minds is intensifying, our universities too must ultimately open themselves more to competition at both the national as well as the international levels. Competition, entrepreneurial spirit, and greater degrees of privatization and internationalization are decisive factors towards paving the way for performance and quality. Let me summarize. Democracy can only secure long-term success in the competition of systems if it succeeds in bringing our educational system to an internationally competitive level as soon as possible. There is one country with a clear educational strategy for intellectual superiority. Already today, science determines progress, our life, our standing. Education and democracy belong together as parts of the two sides of the same coin. Ultimately, only an integrated, internally sound Europe with free citizens will be capable of confidentially representing its interest in the multipolar world of the 21st century as a democracy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Hahn. That was really very insightful, and I think you've really touched on uh, some of the key issues. Uh, let me, there are a number of them, but let me just stress, I think, the focus on early age, early education, is indeed what uh, current research is suggesting is very, very important. The stimuli that uh, children receive at a very early age seem to have tremendous effect uh, later on. So uh, you are to be congratulated for all the work you're doing in that uh, respect. Uh, the challenge that Europe is facing relative to the United States in terms of higher education, especially graduate education and research uh, and development is indeed very well placed. I should mention this panel is co-sponsored uh, uh, with the Center on Global Economic Governance at Columbia University, one of the leading universities uh, in the world. Uh, I happen to be the director and professor there, and we tend to uh, historically do a panel together, and I'm very pleased that this is in fact the panel that uh, is co-sponsored by Columbia. And I should mention that when we were uh, deciding to educate the new generation of economists in the Czech Republic uh, in 1990, we started an American-style PhD program called Center on Economic Research Graduate Education, Serge. The director is sitting right here, Michal Keak. And indeed, we feel European. We were starting something that was very important for Europe. But the leading edge, the best practice, was a US program and the leading European universities in terms of economics, but in other areas as well, uh, indeed run American-style programs because that's the best practice, that's where the most uh, ingenuity is. So um, I think you've really touched on some of the best issues. The Chinese case is indeed uh, another thing which is providing an excellent example of a challenge for Europe. Uh, I've had a number of uh, Chinese students, uh, many of whom have, uh, after finishing their PhDs in the United States, gone back to China. And it's tremendous to see the farsightedness of the Chinese uh, universities. Not only do these students get the best offers, equal offers that they would get in the United States in terms of financial remuneration, in terms of uh, space, possibilities for development, but they are actually tasked to go back to the United States periodically to the best universities in order to maintain their edge, their leading edge, and bring it back to teach in China. 
And indeed, when you look at the rankings, the Chinese now have a number of universities in the top 100, even reaching in the top 50, uh, which, um, as you pointed out, is rare in Europe. And certainly, uh, when we talk about the transition economies in Central East Eastern Europe, it's just unheard of. Um, let me turn to the second speaker, Marcos Antonio Fernandez Martinez, and uh, please give us your presentation. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thanks so much uh, for the organizers of the uh, of, of um, the forum for uh, inviting me to to be a speaker here, uh, particularly in an issue that is very passionate for my research interest. Um, education is a key policy uh, for governments, uh, policy makers, and the general uh, public and is an increasingly studied uh, scholar topic uh, in political science and economics. Perhaps not surprisingly, there is a growing consensus that has emerged on the importance of education for the development of human capital, for the improvement of health, for the overall uh, promotion of better well-being. From a social standpoint of view, education is frequently considered a panacea against poverty, inequality, and social despair. When meeting a certain threshold of quality, education increases the role of technological innovation and fosters economic growth. Therefore, it is not a surprise that several governments around the world have strengthened their efforts to invest in education. In fact, between, 2000, uh, sorry, between 1960 and 2008, the average spending on education in the world increased from 2.5% to 4.8% of the world GDP. Taking into consideration this argument, it is always difficult to talk about education in a region as a whole, as we need to recognize the diversity and complexity of educational achievements and challenges in each country member. But I would like to share with you some remarks of, from my perspective, which are, which are the main challenges of education that Europe is having nowadays. In comparative terms, uh, Western advanced uh, countries have higher years of, of schooling compared compare to other regions of the world. And this is probably a, a very strong uh, uh, strength of, of the Europe. The advanced uh, number, uh, the advanced economies have, in average, 8.2 years of schooling. Compare that to, for example, the tragedy that occurs in in, in Sub-Saharan Africa, that is only three years of uh, average of schooling, or South Asia, 3.1, or Latin America, where I'm from, that uh, it's 5.6, the average years of schooling. But behind these higher educational enrollments. There is a huge challenge, and you talk about that in your presentation, Mr. Carl, the problem of the quality of education. The PISA uh, average scores in math shows that the average in, 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 uh, in the OECD is 494 uh, points. There are several countries that are beyond that uh, average of the OECD. Finland, for example, with 519, uh, Switzerland, Estonia, Belgium, uh, Germany, Czech Republic. Uh, but there are other countries that are showing, uh, in comparative terms, very poor results. Uh, Norway, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Russia. The worst performers in, in Europe, Greece, with 453 four, points, Romania, 445. Bulgaria 439. Furthermore, I think that it's important that we take into consideration that beyond this national average in terms of the challenge of, of, of quality of education, there is also one of the other challenges that the European educational system have, that is the problem of, the problem of inequality. It is a problem of the inequality of access to education and the inequality of access with good quality of opportunities for all its citizens. 
Uh, and in the challenge of this uh, equality of opportunity, opportunities for education, there is the additional problem of how do you integrate successfully your minorities with good education opportunities for everyone. For example, here in Czech Republic, uh, how do you inter integrate successfully the Romani people? The same problem Romania is, is, is having. Or the Turkish in, 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 Germany, in Germany. All of them deserve good education opportunities as their fellow citizens. And this has unfortunately been not achieved uh, by your governments. Here, are, uh, here, again, we know that there are some cases in Europe that have been more successful in achieving better access to broader sec education uh, for broader segments of their populations, for example, the Netherlands or Sweden. And there are growing efforts uh, for promoting more equality for educational opportunities in countries precisely such as in Germany. But we still have a long way to go. And unfortunately, there are other countries that have important shortcomings in educational uh, equality, for example, Spain and England. And as a society, I consider that we should be concerned about these problems, both because of the ethical reasons, as we aspire that democracy provide better public services for all its citizens, not for a few privileged, but also because of pragmatic and, uh, and economic terms. Different recent studies have shown that good quality of education is a key engine for economic growth. And in this sense, I think that Europe is not very different from the challenge that we're facing around the world. In a globalized world where there is global value added commodity chains, the best opportunities for, gov uh, for countries can arise when they have well-qualified human capital. And that reinforces the importance of developing efforts for improving the quality of education. But if this might be considered a straightforward goal that societies should be aspiring, the policies to achieve this good quality of education sincerely are not so easy, is easy identifiable. Neither the political coalitions require uh, to implement them. And I really want to emphasize this part of the political perspective. Because if we are approaching the discussion of education policy, we have to be serious about the political coalitions moving forward for this better quality of education with better equality access for all the citizens. From the supply side a perspective of, edu of educational opportunities, behind the need to change the educational system, there is a redistributional struggle in societies, and we have to acknowledge those redistributional uh, challenges. There is a very complex political relationship in this sense. Uh, particularly, the complexity is even stronger when we acknowledge that public funds are necessary to make these goals feasible. And from a political economy perspective, we are also fully aware of the importance of partisan politics to achieve them, where traditionally it has been the case that right-wing oriented parties promote more efficient, uh, efficiency and concerns, while left-oriented governments tend to push for higher levels of spending on education. However, these stereotypes need to take into consideration also the interaction between the political parties and other institutional organizations such as the business sector. There are countries in which these alliances have made possible the survival, for example, of, a vo of vocational educational training as an alternative to academic higher education. And in this way, the, it has served to provide opportunities for broader segments of the population with less privileged family backgrounds. In fact, in that sense, it has been shown that in countries where vocational educational training has survived, there are lower levels of socioeconomic inequality. Lower levels of, socio of, of inequality can also be achieved with more access to higher education. But it depends, uh, as uh, a recent study by Marius Busmeier, a German political scientist, has shown, 
on how these opportunities of higher education are financed. When they are financed with public sources, investment in education is associated with lower levels of inequality, whereas the opposite holds when private financing dominates. Finally, from the demand side, with this redistributional perspective, and I cannot emphasize enough the challenge of, of this, this redistributional perspective, we need also to consider citizens' preferences when, uh, where not all necessary, all the sectors of the population are active supporter, supporters of providing better, equal educational opportunities. Particularly, this is, is true for those sectors in society which have privilege of better educational opportunities and are fearful of losing their privilege, their better salaries, to having provided a better opportunity for the rest of the populations. In other words, those currently in, in, enjoying higher wages based on their better educational skills are not necessarily enthusiastic of losing them in favor of, of a more equal field of educational opportunities. To address these challenges, quality of education and the equality of educational opportunities, is key that we accept that a healthy democracy requires educated citizens. We know from a long uh, tradition of research in political science, for example, that education is associated with a higher probability to transit to democracy. And once the democracy is the name of the game in a society, education is linked with higher levels of voter turnout and higher levels of political participation. So both for economic and political reasons, it is necessary that the European governments address the challenges that I just mentioned. The health of your democracies and the potential competitiveness of your economies require that your governments act in this front. In other words, it is necessary to move forward the argument that education is a social investment, an instrument for boosting productivity and strengthening their democratic uh, regimes. Fortunately, it seems that this approach is taking, uh, has been taken both by the European Union and the OECD in many of the policy discussions, but sincerely, not with the, the strong emphasis that the challenge ahead requires. This will not be an easy task ahead, and therefore I would like to finish remembering some remarks of your president, Backlack Havel, who underscores the importance of individual responsibility with community concerns for a healthy democracy, remarks consistent precisely with what I just mentioned, a social investment approach of education. And I quote, from whichever angle I look at this menace, I always come to the conclusion that salvation can only come through profound awakening of man to his own responsibility, which is at the same time a global responsibility. Thus, the only way to save, to save our world, as I see it, lies in a democracy that recalls its ancient Greek roots, democracy based on an integral human personality uh, answering for the fate of the community. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you very much, Marco Antonio. That was very insightful. And indeed, I think the emphasis on quality is uh, paramount. Uh, Europe in particular, you can say in many respects, has uh, managed to be educating a large proportion of young people, especially in the younger cohorts. But uh, the quality, and again, that comes back to Karl Hans' point also, the quality is really the big issue. And I think the second uh, related uh, topic, namely the equality of opportunity, access to, uh, to high quality education is, is indeed very, very important. So I think we're having a confluence of ideas here. Our third speaker is Jan Machacek, who for those, many of you know him, for those who don't, uh, he is indeed the uh, one of our best economic journalists in the Czech Republic, educated both here and in the United States. I had the privilege to uh, be with him at the University of Michigan. So Jan, please give us your insights. Hello, thanks for invitation. So I will just have a few uh, quite uh, incoherent uh, remarks. For first, let me say that it's a great privilege to me to sit uh, next to Mr. Han and 
to participate in a discussion with him because I believe that uh, Mr. Han is someone who should have a statue in uh, this country somewhere either in Prague or in Mladá Boleslav because he was the chairman of Volkswagen AG when Volkswagen participated in private privatization in Skoda and um, it was at the time where due to a lot of, uh, I would say, ideological prejudices, there was a time when uh, a lot of people were thinking that we should go with everything to voucher scheme, etc. And um, uh, it was a good luck for this economy that uh, not everything was put into the vouchers and there was also some direct privatization. And, but the direct privatization doesn't have to save everything uh, because the competitor of Volkswagen AG was Renault and nothing against Renault, but I think now after uh, we can for sure say that it was a very good choice and uh, because this company uh, represent 7% uh, uh, GDP of Czech Republic is very successful and also Czechs relate to it very positively. They still consider Škoda to be a Czech car. They don't consider it to be a German car and the people going there to work in a German factory. The, it, most of us would probably agree that this is an our car. And so it's a privilege to sit next to someone who is responsible for, for such a big success of uh, Czech economy. So, and it's a pity that not so many people were interested in uh, seeing him. And I'm glad that you are still in very uh, good health, etc. Uh, when uh, Václav Havel was mentioned, uh, it is kind of paradoxical that uh, Forum 2000 is also a Havelian institution. And uh, this uh, forum uh, is called Democracy and Education. Uh, when I was running Václav Havel's library, I also uh, approach from time to time different donors and they, they said, oh, for instance, could you sponsor the conference on, on Europe or this and that, human rights? I said, oh, if you do a conference on education, that would be, we would definitely love to support it. But for me, it was very complicated to find a uh, connection between Václav Havel and education because Václav Havel himself was an example of someone who was an outsider, he was very educated, but he educated himself. He never uh, participated in any institutional uh, education, but he definitely represented someone who, uh, who, is, who can serve like an example of, uh, of someone who is so hungry for education, like a human being, someone so hungry to be, to, uh, for critical thinking, for, for self-educating uh, that actually there is a connection, but so perhaps in a sense like what should the educational system do to have more people like Václav Havel, who was not only courageous and not only a very talented playwright, but also someone who had enormous thrive to know a lot. And uh, this is what the educational systems should uh, achieve to, to, to to provoke or initiate in human beings a hunger for education, which doesn't have to be necessarily ambition or competitiveness. And uh, it's uh, very funny and ironic that Mr. Han spoke about Korea because I just came back from South Korea. It was my first visit and I was very pleasantly uh, surprised by that. It seems to me that you can see it everywhere that it's a very energetic, uh, uh, dynamic country full of positive energy, but it's, you can also feel that it's not anymore this sort of like Asian collectivist drill or, or memorizing and discipline, but the society feels very free to me. Uh, in, in, uh, and uh, everything is emphasized, everywhere what is emphasized is creativity, fantasy, uh, even indeed individualism into a uh, certain extent, even though it's still a little bit in this Asian way. Let's all be creative now, uh, but, uh, even, uh, but uh, certainly you can even uh, uh, feel that uh, people, young people in cafes, they, they behave in very American or, or European way. So, uh, so this is this is very important thing what you can feel in in the atmosphere, and when Mr. Han spoke about China, 
I am still, uh, because there has been a lot of disputes about it. There, there was a whole issue of foreign affairs magazine devoted to the, is, is America in decline or not because of the educational system? Obviously, Asians are not uh, stupid. They know they have to emphasize creativity. They have to emphasize critical thinking. But still, the question is, is the discipline st still so much in their genes that that uh, they will never make it in a way because the basis of American may be superior, as some said, educational system is that teachers, like Mr. Schweinar is an example, but teachers provoke students to disagree with them, to dispute, to, which is something which in Asia definitely and to an extent in Europe is, is uh, very often considered uh, impolite. So the question is, okay, uh, Chinese are doing better and better in mathematics and this and that, that will, will they ever achieve this? <coughs> uh, uh, when Mr. Yan, uh, Han, uh, Han uh, sorry, actually there is also Mr. Yan working in Volkswagen AG who is mm -hmm. Czech, so sorry, mm -hmm. I just, uh, Mr. Han uh, mentioned that uh, the, these, uh, these better or excellent uh, results of American uh, universities in comparison with continental ones. So, but I'm asking myself, is it really that black and white, like how come that uh, German economy is doing so well? And that says, maybe you guys don't have uh, Apple and you don't have uh, Facebook, but your cars are superior. Uh, your economy is a star of, uh, of your zone, even though the productivity results are not that excellent. But, uh, everybody can be envious. So is it such a problem that the European universities are not that hungry for this precise measurement of their, of their uh, results? And in the US is very important factor which we are somehow uh, don't, we in Europe hesitate to take, to accept it as a measurement, like the, the money is an important factor, like the, the the first wages of the students and, and wages of the professors, etc. So, I also admire U.S. universities, absolutely. I had a chance to be a fellow there, etc. But uh, I'm just like asking critical uh, question if, that, if that's really so uh, bad with us at the uh, continent. What is uh, certainly not uh, very good in this country in particular is, uh, is languages. The main question is, do politicians want people to be smart and educated in languages actually in this country especially? I am not that sure myself because still uh, with the films and TV, all the countries, even in Albania, they, they, they stopped uh, dubbing foreign films, especially English and American films. But in this country, we are dubbing more and more, like even like the documents of BBC on public television are, are being dubbed, and no politicians ever want to do anything about it. So they, I'm often asking myself questions that if people are less educated, they are, they are better manipulated by stupid ideology and stupid uh, slogans, uh, because it's such an easy to arrange it. If they could have arranged it in Albania five years ago, why they cannot arrange it? it uh, in this country. And I think the languages and English at very first, this is a really important uh, point to survive in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a globalization. And this is completely disconnected, but uh, everybody speaks about it these days. So, so even with the migra migration crisis and with the Eurozone crisis, this is very important and the, there is a uh, there is the name of the conference, Democracy and Education. So uh, if we speak about European Union, about migrants, about Eurozone crisis, it is very important that Europe shouldn't only improve its uh, technical or education or mathematics or this and that, but it really needs to focus a lot on civic education to know the basis of European integration, to know People don't know what the Schengen is, what made them, they might know what Schengen is, but they don't know what Dublin Treaty is. They don't know about these, they don't know these elementary rules of very important uh, things. 
if we speak about more federalism in Europe, we don't even agree in Europe what the federalism is. Some people think it's centralization, other people... Uh, so it's very important when we mentioned America to also compare European experiment or European project with the uh, finished uh, US federal system. And these are very important for people to understand these things, like if we speak about protection of outer border, if we uh, uh, speak about this and that, uh, after this was cancelled under the communists like a mandatory subject, uh, občanská nauka or civic education, still it was never properly replaced by, by, by something that people would really know about the constitution, they would know about civic rights, they would know about human rights, but they, would, they really need to understand this European integration system better, because now, even starting since yesterday and what's happening during the day today, even I am absolutely confused and I consider myself an expert on the European Union, what is, what is uh, which rules are uh, in, in power and which rules are not in power. Some politicians say, let's cancel the rules for a while. It's time for flexibility and improvisation. Then a week later, there is time for rules again. So I am even like an expert for European Union. I am absolutely confused. So civic education is equally important as all these results of American universities and mathematics and this and that. So that's enough from my part. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you very much, Jan. And indeed, I'm glad you've uh, brought up the issue. I mentioned at the beginning that Carl Hahn has a really illustrious uh, career in business generally, but for the Czech Republic, indeed, uh, we owe you a, a great debt of gratitude for uh, having created one of the best companies, if not the best company, uh, on uh, Czech soil. So uh, Jan has obviously raised a number of interesting issues, including the paradox of why is it that the German economy is doing so well if it is not doing so well in the rankings. I think there is a, uh, a complicated story there. Why don't we at this point turn to you, allow you to ask uh, some questions, uh, we'll collect some questions and uh, then uh, get the uh, panelists to respond. Uh, feel free to address it to a specific panelist or to the entire panel, whatever you would like, and uh, you can broaden the scope of discussion, of course, as you uh, would like to. There we have first question. And please introduce yourself briefly so we, we know who you are. Does it work? Yes. Yep. Uh, good afternoon. Gindra Stoponavichus, coming from Lithuania, from Vilnius. Uh, my question is uh, to Karl Hahn uh, on the topic of uh, future of European universities. Uh, you have mentioned that only, not only rankings show uh, that <coughs> quite big number of uh, European universities are not tackling the challenges um, in front of them. And uh, you were mentioning as well this um, lack of interpretation entrepreneurial spirit uh, among universities. But what would be your sort of advice or recipe in more precise way speaking uh, or advising universities? You also, with uh, some cautiousness, mentioned privatization. Is it about privatization? Maybe governance? What is uh, in your mind on, on that topic? Thank you. I'm afraid I didn't quite understand your, your question. What is your advice for how to improve higher education in Europe? Is it privatization? Is it uh, governance? Uh, is it yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. It is in comparison with the United States, with the successful people there who are really the leaders. There is no doubt when, like in Germany, you have civil servants with jobs guaranteed for life, running a university, at a time when the world changes at supersonic speed and only the best can survive. This system don't go together. It's like hell 
like uh, he heaven and hell. And consequently, the spirit in American schools, which is now also being introduced into the lower level schools, in the regular schools apart from the universities, there is just no competition in Europe. We try to educate our people in Germany in particular, like in a hothouse. There is, in one state of Germany, we have 15 or 16, we have 16 ministers of education. None of these ministers of education has ever seen a Chinese kindergarten, a Chinese university. And only when you open up to the best, you find the yardstick where you go, when you ask your parents, your industry, what type of education do our children need for the year, year 2040? You must project the year 2040, and you must then come back and prepare the children for this time and age. And this is not only mathematics. It is also the cultural getting together. And I was last at a university, leading university in Beijing and talked with the rector. He told me that now they are emphasizing not anymore that they move into creating high caliber specialists, but uh, they are now also realizing the importance of the cultural <laughs> side and the human side to create teams globally working together. I remember we had one team re-engineering a car, Shanghai production, Brazilian production, with a Shanghai and a Brazilian team. These people must go together. I remember when we developed an automatic transmission with a foreign automobile manufacturer to save money. We lost money in inside fights between these Germans and their other counterparts, as they were not educated for working beyond these mental processes of a different education and philosophy and so on. Let me take the opportunity also to mention one thing. Uh, you questioned a little bit uh, that the Chinese might not be the best mathematicians in the world. I can only tell you what I see now. Chinese taking over mathematical type of industries. Higher is one example. Uh, Uawai is a high example for this. We have now more and more Chinese companies being world leaders on the basis of research, not on the basis of just having cheap labor. This plays no role whatsoever. I am together with a Chinese company called Beijing Genomics Institute. This company has a capacity of 50% of the world genetic uh, sequencing of uh, uh, genes for people. Uh, in this company, you feel like being in an American college. There are they have one problem when I was there last. Well, I must tell you two things about it. 10 years ago, they had 100 people and two uh, Chinese American educated. Today, they have two people Chinese educated running the place, arriving in the office every day with bicycle, and they have 6,500 people. And their problem, they explained to me, I couldn't believe, I didn't understand the problem, but it shows their thinking. They told me, you know what, our average age in the company has gone up from 24 to 26. Well, with these youngsters, with this spirit, it's all a matter of spirit. Our European co-citizens haven't understood market economy how it functions. They are, and many politicians, against rich people. That's why they all moved to London <laughs> and uh, not to Berlin. Uh, we, we don't see the function of a capitalist. We don't see the difference between capital and money. We have so many basic things which make us 
not understand in an intelligent way the world of today, and this is why the Chinese move so fast and we move so uh, little. That we are happy when we move at 1% per year, and these Americans move at 3 This is just uh, impossible in the long run. And let me tell you finally something to the mathematical uh, capabilities of the Chinese who were living on trees when uh, I came first to China. The first year of Volkswagen production in China, overnight, we had 24.7% of the market. We sold 1,700 cars. This shows you where the Chinese came from. And today, the fastest supercomputer is a Chinese supercomputer for the first time with 32 billiard, billion operations per second. The second best is an American with 27, a Swiss with 10, and a German with uh, 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 4 and uh, you have some Americans in between. But I wanted to tell, we have a completely new world, and you cannot organize the improvement of your educational system without going where the best people are. And you cannot improve on your system, you must go where the best people are. And I have, I'm sorry when I bring you another of my hobby horse, in my young days, Japan was world famous as a manufacturer of junk, period. Everybody knows this. And the Germans were famous for quality. Everybody knows it. At a sudden, the Europeans had to learn that the Japanese were not calculating quality anymore as a percentage. And they were so stupid. They calculated quality, pieces go wrong for by one million pieces. Every expert knows this was idiotic. But today it is standard. And it was invited, invented by American professors who didn't get their feet on the ground and developed the Japanese to quality levels, and we benefited by them. It took us some time to understand what was going on. I just wanted to take this as examples of the speed of change of yesterday. And of course, with the 30 billion computer operation per second, the speed is advancing in incredible paces. And this is we have to prepare our people for culturally, mentally, psychologically, as the work will be completely different, and the machines will do their work. We manage them in their work, we supervise them, but we, at the same time, are at the approach now that we talk about artificial intelligence connecting the human being with the computer mm -hmm. in order to improve his uh, connectivity, his uh, potential, and so on. So this is what we should be talking about. And the last thing I say today, <laughs> before you stop me, in our kindergarten, we use whiteboards, electronic whiteboards. And I can tell you, these children are so enthusiastic that they can touch the whiteboard, and the whiteboard is playing with them and tells them right or wrong, that when they talk about animals, they are moving into Australia. When they dance Chinese songs, they have on the whiteboard, of course, Chinese dancing, the Chinese lettering, and they jump up and down and get oxygen to learn faster and get their uh, mental processes going. But hardly the majority of schools in Germany use not whiteboards. They, they still work with charcoal and schiefertafel. Uh, uh, I don't know what the word is in English. But uh, it's just, we just must get away from our old thinking in a completely new world. 
Well, that was certainly very impressive. I had no intention of stopping you because I agree with you completely, so I thought uh, this was exactly the right answer uh, to give. If I may, I would just stress one point you mentioned briefly, which I think is really important in the region, but in Europe in, in general, uh, and that's the distinction that in the United States, the management of the universities is really the management, and the incentives are set extremely strongly for quality, and the equivalent of the rector, the president of the university, the provost, the deans, would go very quickly if they did not follow that particular rule. When you compare it, how universities are run in your country or here, uh, they are still in very much the old mode on average, and there are really relatively few European places, there are places, that behave the American way, if you want, in this particular way. The competition that's created then is extremely important because it doesn't matter how the school is owned. Some of the best schools in America, like University of California at Berkeley, University yeah. of Michigan, are public, are state-owned, mm -hmm. right? Others, Harvard, yes. Columbia, etc., are private. But we all act as if we were private, essentially. It's the competition and the force of the incentives and punishments if you fail to meet the competition. All right, let's go. Here are some more questions. My name is Milada Dombrovska, and, and uh, I would like um, to tell uh, her, Mr. Jan, you are really a legend of uh, concern uh, Volkswagen. I can tell it because I was um, I worked uh, one year in Volkswagen Bratislava in Tuareg. Uh, preparation of lines and uh, one and a half year in uh, Wolfsburg. Uh, the university studium is very, very important. And um, I would like uh, is um, really uh, education of unemployed uh, people. Uh, can you tell us uh, something about uh, um, daughter uh, company from, con from con uh, concern Volkswagen? Out of 5,000, uh, the education of uh, thousands, uh, thousands uh, unemployed uh, people. And um, the second, uh, second uh, I saw the very uh, near cooperation uh, Braunschweig University with the Volkswagen concern and uh, uh, do you mean uh, is uh, the same situation in Czech Republic? I mean uh, Mlada Boleslav is the same and another uh, university. Thank you. I have problems in understanding. Here. Understanding. So the, he, the question, the essence of it is if you could talk a little bit more about the experience of the, was it Bratislava, right? And your Volkswagen's experience there and the collaboration with the universities that you have. And it was the University of Braunschweig you mentioned? No. It was uh, only um, experience uh, by uh, what I uh, heard uh, about the cooperation uh, University Braunschweig, Braunschweig with the uh, Wolfsburg, uh, Wolfsburg uh, Volkswagen. Yeah. Volkswagen. Well, I can tell you the first thing we did when we took uh, our uh, Skoda investment, we educated the people on the German side about the history of the Czech Republic, its relationship over the century, and uh, in order to familiarize everybody that they knew what enormous tradition here as an auto, we talk about Germany as an automobile company, but uh, the pioneering at the very beginning of the automobile uh, took also place in the Czech Republic and the leading engineers uh, were here at uh, Tatra, at uh, Škoda, at uh, many places, take Java, Mr. Janicek, and all that. So we, we have here also a pioneering countries in the automobile. It was easy, therefore, for us to come to a normal uh, cooperation. 
Very good. Done? I seem to have problems with this acoustic. Without and the ed education of uh, unemployed people for uh, yeah. out of 5,000. Yeah, well, I, I can tell, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. I mentioned that we have tens of millions of people getting unemployed by the automatic factory. And we must prepare our people for this. And the American who invented the, auto, the first self-driving automobile. Later at Google, did the Go Google photograph business of the world, basis for our GPS systems and so on. After this, this uh, man started some four years ago, a uh, university via internet, and he is training people who are in danger of losing their jobs for jobs of tomorrow in the electronic industry, in the software industry, in all that. And with American speed, you can read this in The Economist of last week, this man is by the name of Thorn, coming from Germany, typical German, fed up with the over-bureaucratic system, went to the United States and turned out to be a success, from success to success. Uh, this man has now, in a couple of years, already four million people being registered at his university. So when we have strategies and you need, of course, people being prepared for this challenge, then you can help these people. And as we know this will happen, we know exactly how many millions of people were we will have. We must have a completely different type of strategy using electronic media. I'm not talking about electronic media for our schools or something else to a certain degree. But uh, we need also to bring the grown-ups to give them a second chance on life. And uh, this can be done. Here you have again, look at what the Americans do. And we must always, in industry, when we have a problem, the first thing we do, we go to the person who does it best. And then we deduct what we do with it. And what we do with this market, or this product line, and so on. And the first thing we then decide, how to be better, as otherwise we, we don't need. And the same applies to prepare our Europeans to remain competitive with the uh, Americans and the Asiatic people and the Japanese and so on, and hopefully also other countries. We are such a small Europe world by everybody connected for free with everybody. Uh, that's what we have to do. And we must create a different type. It's a scandal that no European has invented a Google. Why don't we have this climate? Mm -hmm. And I learned this morning in a session, uh, the uh, uh, telephone, I think, uh, Jobs, the man from mm -hmm. uh, iPad, uh, iPhone, he was a Syrian immigrant. America attracts the best people in the world. Mm -hmm. That's our problem. And this we must stop in a peaceful way and giving them the chances America gives them. So it's so simple and so complicated with our mentality of uh, a school system where the teachers, in the German case, have a guarantee for life employment okay. in America. Public school, uh, government schools are now handed over to parents. And every teacher in America knows when he is not successful in bringing the children to good results, he's losing his job. Very simple. Thank you very much. I think we could have more questions, but we have to end. Let me allow the other two panelists to say a few words, and then we'll continue in the hallways. Uh, I just want to add uh, to what it has been said. What I mean, what worries me of what it has been said is that 
the politics of these educational changes has not been taken into consideration in a serious way. Government's not, I mean, it's not a matter of saying, oh, okay, we have just to move the American way. I mean, in the case of the Americans, for example, I, I know very well because I, I studied over there. I mean, there is a struggle right now how to reform secondary education. I mean, it's not as simple as if they're going to the private schools, no. I mean, there is a huge discussion with unions depending where the unions are strong in the, in the American states. I mean, the discussion on how do we select better teachers, how do we evaluate them, how do we use standardized testing or not, or other instruments to, to provide better information to create the better schools so they can provide better students to universities. You are a, a professor in an American university yeah. and you see firsthand that the problem is being on the undergraduate level. I mean, yes, the American universities are the best because they have the best graduate programs. But at the undergraduate level, the challenge is very similar to what is taking place in, in, in Europe and we have to acknowledge that. And we have to acknowledge in these struggles the politics behind those struggles. It's not a matter of saying, oh yes, we have to go this way or that way, because I mean, there are political coalitions resisting changes. I mean, you, I, I saw it firsthand in Humboldt University. I mean, that type of, of entrenched interests that really resist change to go the American way are huge. I mean, sorry, but that, that to, I'm going to be very politically incorrect, but professors over there, I mean, are, I mean, the way that they are being evaluated is very questionable. I mean, it's not the tenure track uh, system as the American uh, way that pushes for excellency and competition. So I really think that, I mean, all these characteristics that you point out, many of them, I agree, have to be observed through also the political circumstances that make it uh, uh, happen. And this, I mean, unfortunately, we don't have the time to go in a much deeper way, but if we do not take into consideration that, we're just gonna be providing naive policy prescriptions because are very hard to implement. All right, I'll let Jan Machacek say a few words. <clears throat> I said uh, everything important. I just, uh, uh, I'm also a supporter of America, but since it is my role to ask critical questions, I still would love to know why, why Germans are still doing so well if their education is so uh, weak in comparison uh, with, with the US, like maybe you don't have an iPhone, but uh, look at the American bus. American buses are looking like the same like last 60 years or something. Look at American school bus and look at German bus. So I don't know, like, so I'm, I concluded with the questions. Like, could you please, in two sentences, tell me your opinion on this? Like, that are you two, like, uh, Pessimistic about Europe or Germany? Uh, I'm pessimistic not about uh, Europe, but uh, I realize that unless we change fundamentally our attitude, our thinking, unless we find satisfaction in working according to Confucius. Confucius said 2,500 years ago, when you love your work, never will you have to work again. When you have this spirit that you are married to your work and not only to your family, this is not reducing your love for your family, but you must do things with enthusiasm and uh, creativity. The climate for creativity means that you're not blamed when something goes wrong that you are not overcautious, that you are uh, having a team to exchange and to help you to not really make a big mistake, but at least to try this way, that way. Out of this spirit of Silicon Valley, uh, of uh, working day and night, young people, why shouldn't they work day and night? This attitude we uh, must spread in Europe, we try this. But uh, we need for, for this a climate which is in the research of our factories 
and uh, the engineering of our factories, but it's also a climate among our workers. We had to learn in the years past how to organize an assembly line. Mm -hmm. You have a department doing this. You can ask the workers doing it. They, they know best how to do it. They should be motivated for this. You know, and they should be realizing that every cent they save, every money they make by new ideas, that this is part and parcel for staying successful with a decent income in a nice world. And we have today for everybody, he can travel everywhere at no cost. He can telephone everywhere at zero cost. We live in such a world we have not realized how well off we are, how our medicine is advancing. And by the way, that's also not a joke. Research has shown people with a higher IQ, people with a mathematical inclination, they live longer, they live healthier, uh, they create more to the GNP, and uh, this is naturally when you live in a more intelligent level, when a four-year-old child has a higher degree of developed, wired, programmed intelligence, of course he will react differently and uh, move faster and enjoy life more. People love this, and we, we just have to love our work, love our success, like sports people. We expect sports people today to work and train day and night, and we must, this sport spirit must be spread all over Europe, and for this we need ministers of education, which go first of all to America, to Silicon Valley, to Harvard and uh, California and uh, China and Japan and see how it's done. They must find out why did the Japanese beat to death the German entertainment industry? And the better question is, why did the Koreans beat to death the Japanese entertainment industry? How could this happen? I'm and with this spirit, we live in this world you know, and so on. On that note, please join me in thanking the panelists. Thank you very much. And naturally, you can continue informally after we split right now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you.